All right. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview. And today we have a very, very, very special guest, Patrick Bet David. How are you doing today, Patrick? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Fantastic, man. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the interview. It's good to be on with you, man. Yes, sir. So let's jump right in. My first question for you today, Patrick, is what is your story? What is my story? Okay, so I was born and raised in Iran. I lived in Iran um, for 10 years. Uh, six weeks after Khomeini died, uh, he died June 3rd, 89. Uh, I, uh, we escaped. We went to Germany. I lived at a refugee camp in Germany for two years. And then from there came to the States. America lived in Glendale, California, six years. Uh, went into the Army, 101st Airborne, got out, wanted to be a bodybuilder. Uh, met a girl who was working at Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter at the time. She uh, introduced me to the industry. I got into it a day before 9-11, exactly a day before 9-11 on 9-10 on a Monday. And then uh, stayed uh, with Morgan uh, for a short period. Then I went to Transamerica for seven and a half years and then started PHP agency on October of 09 with 60 agents. And today we have 5,200 licensed agents in 49 states and an accidentally started valuetainment that is what it is today. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, I kind of want to, I kind of want to go back and dig in a little bit to your history. Um, you know, you said you were you were in Iran for for ten years. Um, mm -hmm. What sort of events transpired in Iran that you would say have kind of helped shape you to the person that you are today? So, um, what's the best way to put it for you? To, so this makes sense. So my level of paranoia and skepticism is typically higher than the average person I meet. And so let me explain what I mean by that. Because in Iran, we steadily didn't have freedom. Uh, it was a dictatorship. So they're telling you what to do. So you're not constantly able to count on anything taking place or being around or who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Nothing was guaranteed. And so you're always skeptical. You couldn't trust everybody. You couldn't talk to everybody because you don't want to tell the wrong person what your family's religion is because maybe we're Christians living in that type of an environment and you're going to be judged. You know, and I'm Armenian and a Syrian living in a place like that. Which side do you lean politically? What do you think about? What do you think about that? Um, so when I came here, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, you, your guard's always up. So you're playing a lot of defense. And, uh, you know, in the sports world, if you got a great defense combined with a great offense, you're a dangerous team. So I automatically had defense in place because of the streets. You don't trust everybody. And in Germany, when I lived in a refugee camp, uh, think about living in a place where everybody who escaped their country and they are escaping communism, dictatorship. Um, lack of freedom of religion because there's religion authorities. If you're not this faith, you're this. Uh, and we're all living together. I got stabbed in that refugee camp in a good fight that took place. I was 11 at the time when it happened. Some guy really, uh, 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 you know, was a interesting kid from Afghanistan. We got to a fight. He was a good friend of mine. He stabbed me all of a sudden. Um, uh, just a lot of weird things happened when I lived there. So, again, you come out of that environment. Your guard's kind of up. So I had to learn offense. I had natural defense when I got into sales and I learned offense that helped me in business because in a world of business, everybody and their mothers wants to put you out of business, everybody, because you have a piece of their business. You have their customers, you have their territory, you have their area, you have their market, you have their this. And so they're not wanting more competition, fewer competition. In an ideal world, if you were to ask every single business today, if New York Life, if Google, if Amazon, if Walmart, if if you know, Facebook, if Goldman Sachs, if Merrill, if Coldwell Bank or BFA, if you could ask them today, you have the choice to be the only bank in town in America. You have the choice to be the only social media site. You have the choice to be LinkedIn would go out of business. We would have to shut down Google Plus. We would have to shut down everything. Would you be OK with that? What would everybody say? Yes, absolutely. Because ideally, everybody would want to have a, the first idea where it's almost like a monopoly because the last closest thing we had to a monopoly was Microsoft where he even got sued and, you know, he's sitting there going to court, hey, you're controlling the marketplace. You're too big. You're putting everybody out of business. You're buying everybody out. So what do you, so ideally people would want to do that. So you need to know that in the world of business, that's what's going to happen to you. So if you don't have that, you will be shell-shocked by how people 
bully or run at times. So you need to have that radar. So that probably helped me out a lot in the, in the world of business. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, um, you know, then I believe you said you, you escaped to Germany um, and, you, and you were there for a period of time. Um, what was the catalyst that fueled um, the, the, the move from Germany to the States? How, how did you make that transition and what was that like for you uh, in your life at that point? So we always went to Germany with the idea of coming to the States. That was always uh, 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 the plan. And a lot of times when people would escape Iran, they would either go to Austria, they would either go to uh, Germany, they would go to Spain or Australia. We went to Germany. And that was our transition to make it out to here. Wow. So when when you did um, first come to, to the United States, can you kind of take us through the, chron the chronology in a bit more detail of how you really got established, how you got your feet planted, and how you eventually made your way into business. Yeah, so I mean, I was a 1.8 GPA kid in high school. Uh, I, I didn't do well in school. I liked math. Math is the only one that I, you know, caught my attention. I couldn't, I didn't care a lot about history at that time. Um, I was not a good uh, English writer or any of that because even in college, I never took. Uh, English 101. It was always ESL. I've never taken an English 101 class. Let me put it to you that way. It's always been English as a second language. The highest level I made, I think it was like ESL 4, is, uh, is what I made it to. So, you know, having said that, um, aside from that, when I, when I got in, I started selling when I was in Germany at a swimming pool. I would collect the beer bottles and I started selling stuff over there. And that was my first entrepreneurial experience that I had. And then when we came to Germany, Iran, and to U.S., I would always, um, I always had something to sell. I would buy hats at a 99 cent store, and I would sell it for seven bucks. You know, if you bought two, I'd buy, sell it to you for 12 bucks, two for 12 or one for seven. And I was making 700 percent profit. That's kind of working out good for me. Um, I would sell baseball cards. I would sell anything I could get my hands on. And so when I went into the military, in the military, I would sell supplements. I would sell uh, creatine. HMB, uh, V2G, uh, you would come to my uh, uh, room and he would open up the closet and I had all of these supplements that everybody wanted. Uh, and I would buy it from a wholesaler, then I would resell it to my guys uh, at the unit. And so that was that. And then when getting out, um, I was working at Valley Total Fitness selling memberships and um, this girl introduced me. She would always pick me up in a different car and I would say, you know, how do you make your money? She was a 24 year old girl who was a financial advisor for many of the Laker players. She was in the right uh, contacts. And we dated, I think, for like a three or six month period. And uh, she uh, uh, introduced me to the industry. I got into it with Morgan, you know. And then business side, one day I decided to start PHP. Um, it was um, bootstrapped. It was all my money. I didn't have any investor capital, no VC, no angels, no nothing. And so the first Year, two years, three years, we almost went out of business multiple, multiple times. My entire life savings I put into it. We went all the way down to, uh, at one point, we had $13,000 in a checking account. And that's not a lot of money when you run a good company. We were about to go out of business and things turned. And then from there, momentum took off for us. That's incredible. That's incredible. So when, when you first started PHP, what were the steps that you took in order to build that company? And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of asking from the perspective of a, a young entrepreneur who's just getting sure. started and wants to build yep. a company as big as, as yours. So think about it. There's five transitions that almost every um, successful, established, wealthy entrepreneur goes through. So let's identify those five steps, right? Number one is you have a job. And so when you first have a job, sometimes one of the best things to have is a job because you got to realize what you hate the most, right? What you don't hate, you learn to tolerate. So if you don't have a job, say, man, I hate, hate this job. I can't believe the job I have. That makes you want to leave and go become independent rep or whatever it is. So first it's a job. Then you become a salesperson. So then you have to learn how to sell. If you don't know how to sell just a game of business, it's going to be very tougher because you got to be able to learn how to sell. Gates knew how to sell. Zuckerberg sold himself out of court troubles. So did Jobs. So did Cuban. So did all these guys. You got to learn how. Even the nerds learn how to sell, right? So a person cannot say, my personality is not a selling personality. Good luck to you in the world of sale because you got to sell me 
who's a CEO to come and work with. You got to sell uh, me if I'm an engineer. I need to come and do coding for you. You got to sell me if I'm an attorney to say, well, I'll be your attorney, even though you're so small and risky. But I w- everything is sale. So then you learn how to sell. Then you learn how to lead a group of salespeople. Because if I learn how to sell, I got to teach another person to sell this product or this membership or this car. I got to learn to teach somebody else to sell it, right? And then you become somebody who learns how to drive others. Then you learn how to run a business. You open up an office. You have rent. You have office lease. You buy equipment. You have desks. You have an assistant. You have front desk, paperwork, processor, you know, digital market, all these things you're hiring. And then you become a CEO. So your question is, you know, what did I do at the beginning when I started a company? Uh, What initial steps I took? Number one is I knew everything revolved around sales. So for instance, if I'm sitting around and there's nothing going on and the business is not working, I'm picking, I'm picking up the phones. I'm picking up the phones and I'm getting on the phones. I'm calling somebody. Hey, who do we call? Hey, can we dial somebody? Hey, can we talk to this person? Hey, let me send a message to this guy on LinkedIn. Let me send a message to this guy on Facebook. Let me send an email back to this guy. Let me text this guy. Did I follow up with this guy? Let me tweet this guy. Let me Facebook this guy. I'm in office because without, you know, a, a, you know, number of sales coming in, nothing's really happening. Then I realized my weakness. So you go through the, uh, the, the quadrants of becoming a CEO. Top is exponential. Bottom is linear. So on the bottom part, you have operations, which is hiring staff, all this other stuff. Then you have biz dev. Biz dev is relationship networking. I would go to meet with all the insurance companies. I remember one time, like on a 90 day period, I took 60 flights and I met with every single insurance executive, vice president, CEO I could even find. I was always on the road meeting with these guys and I'm doing biz dev, biz dev, biz dev, biz dev, biz dev. But biz dev doesn't explode your business, right? Biz dev is linear, but you're building relationships. <laughs> then I came out with campaigns. This next month, we're going to do this. If you do this, you know, this next one, we're going to do that. This next quarter, we're going to focus on this. 2018, we're going to focus on this. Then I came up with uh, leadership development by taking my employees and making this guy better. Like Mario, you just met. I met Mario when he was 18 years old. Mario just turned 30. He's been with me for 12 years. This is not the same Mario as 12 years ago because we built him. We built him more. We built this entire team into what it is today of leadership development. So then, you know, once you have a core army team system, CRM technology, then it's expanding, right? So now this year we're going to try to do this. And this year we're going to try to do it. And it's getting thicker and thicker and thicker. But the beginning stages, all sales. That's incredible. That's incredible. So you mentioned earlier on how you really developed your offense once you started really getting into, into sales. And, and it seems like we keep kind of coming back to sales. So can we do a little bit of a deeper dive into sales and talk about uh, the, the process or, or maybe just the most important parts of becoming uh, a salesman? How do we do it? Yeah. So look, here's here. People ask me. So let's address three things together. So one, Pat, how do I become happy? You got to be aligned, right? I like things to be clear. So a person who's bitter is a person who's not creating is a person that's not part of a community. Right. And it's a person that's, you know, kind of to themselves and, you know, they're not really doing anything. So that person becomes bitter. Happiness is somebody that's aligned, which means what you believe in, what you do are aligned. When you do what you believe in, you're happy, you're aligned, you're not uncomfortable. You know, this is why you see somebody who's a Christian person who smokes marijuana is happy because to them, they believe that God created marijuana and I'm very happy smoking weed. And then you meet the same Christian person, another person that's Christian that doesn't smoke weed and they're happy because to them, they believe that marijuana gives you additional symptoms that you're not normal, that's not good for society. But they're both happy because they're aligned. Make sense? So it's, it's what's aligned here uh, to them. So you asked the question about sales, okay? You asked the question about sales. For me, if you want to become an extremely good leader and, you know, figure out ways where you become a good CEO, entrepreneur, the top skill to learn on one side is learning how to process issues because you learn how to process this. Our next step is this. And process really issues is, okay, this is not turning on. Why not? Because of this. Let me check this. Okay, that's good. let me check the battery. The battery is good. Why is, is it receivers working? Is it not? I'm going so many until I identify exactly why this isn't working, right? Okay. But the other side in life, I'm sorry. I mean, if you want to marry a hot girl, I just had lunch right now with a couple and uh, I came back. 
And the guy that I had a lunch with, his girlfriend is drop dead gorgeous. And I'm sitting there with my wife. They're both hot. And the, neither one of us are the best looking guys in the restaurant. You know what I'm saying? And he's got swagger and he's not afraid of asking the hottest girl a question and flirt with her or whatever. And, you know, he's got to drop the, uh, you know, gorgeous girl. You know, you meet a guy and you look at that and say, how the hell did he hook up with her? Shit, that makes no sense. What the hell is that all about? <laughs> he, knows, he knows how to sell. I mean, really, it's what it is. He knows how to sell. You know, you, you see a lot of ugly men marry beautiful women. It's because they know how to sell. And then you see, have you ever seen an extremely good looking guy marry an ugly girl? He has no idea how to sell. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So <laughs> right. In a world of business, you see somebody that's here all of a sudden decides to work with a company that's here. Like, why is this guy working? Because this guy here knew how to sell this guy into getting into this business. So how did he pick up that guy? You know, how did, how did this team all of a sudden, how were they able to put such a great team together with Golden State Warriors where everybody in the league is afraid of them? Because they sold people on come and Steve Kerr sold Andre Iguodala to come off the bench while he was a starter and he was averaging 23 points a game. And what do you mean you want me to come off the bench? And he wins MVP of the finals. Okay, this make this is all sales, right? So you're not gonna you're not gonna be by the way even if somebody says well i'm not a fan of a salesperson because my goal is to just set up funnels and i'm a drop shipping guy and i like to drop ship that's sales because your emails are sales your you know posts are sales the clicks on how simple it is for me to click on a buy now check out now those things are all sales the minimizing from five steps to buying something to three that's sales the lingo you use to close a deal at sales um Nothing is done in the world of business unless a person learns how to sell. Nothing. Uh, nothing. There's this notion in the marketplace that there are a lot of nerds who become billionaires because they don't know how to sell. So you don't need to know how to sell. That's BS. That is an absolute crock. There's nothing valid about that. If you don't know how to sell, you're going to get killed. These nerds learn how to sell their idea to other people. These nerds learn how to sell their ideas to an investor. You know, and so it's very, very important to realize that that is something. So, for instance, if I know that's exactly what I need to learn, guess what I'm doing next? Go on Amazon, type in the word sales, selling, negotiation. Buy every single book you can find, even if it costs $600. Buy them all. I'm not telling you here to go buy my book. I don't have a book on sales. So I'm not endorsing like, hey, go buy my book because I have all the secrets in there. I'm telling you to go buy them all. Go buy the Red Book. Go study Hopkins. Go study Brian Tracy. Go study every one of these guys out there that are negotiators. Every one of these guys that wrote anything and everything on having to do with sales. Go buy it. And then all of a sudden you'll notice three months later, six months, 12 months later, 24 months later, you're speaking a different language. You sound different. You know, you're, you're, you're smoother. People are buying. People are wanting to work with you. Things will adjust. But the first step is you got to learn how to sell. Actually, that's even more important than having an idea. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, sales and the importance, and, and you just mentioned how uh, imperative it was to, to educate yourself on these things that you don't know how to do. Well, in, in your lifetime, um, how have you gone about educating yourself uh, on the skills that you need? And, and to this day, how do you continue to educate yourself and, and uh, develop further? I'm just curious, you know, access to information right now, it's at such a high level that you know, you can <clears throat> you can learn anything nowadays on YouTube. You just go type in how to, right? I mean, how to learn seven hacks of Instagram. It's so easy. It's all out there. How to make a tie. I was at a wedding and one day two of my friends, they come up to me and they say they want me to marry them. And I said, listen, man, I'm, I, I'm, I can't marry anybody. I'm not a pastor. I, I don't care to be one. I have no desire to be an ordained. He says, no, it's the state of California. You just need to sign this. Anybody can be a pastor. I'm like, Religion of, he says, no, you don't need to have a religion of anything. You just become a pastor. I'm like, you're out of your mind. He says, no, I'm telling you, Pat, we want you to marry us. I'm like, you're serious. Yes. This girl was in Hollywood. She had her own TV show. I said, okay, no problem. Give me the weekend to think about it. I think about it Monday. I tell him yes. So I do this wedding. I go to a wedding. On the way to the wedding, I have a bow tie. I have no idea how to do a bow tie. We're in the parking lot of the wedding. Hollywood is shooting the wedding. There's 300 people at the wedding. I take YouTube and I go type in how to tie a bow tie. Right? <laughs> and I'm sitting there in the parking lot. Guests are coming. Hey, Pat. Hey, 
and I'm tying a bow tie on top of my car. I got this thing like trying to find I put it on. And obviously, the first time you do a bow tie, it's all crooked. Yeah. And uh, I go inside. You know, I, I think nowadays, I'm, I'm more the guy where you know how you drive a car and there are people that say, no, I'm going to find this place. Where is this restaurant at? I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that says, uh, excuse me, sir, sir, sir. Do you know where is such and such restaurant? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's over there on the right. Okay, perfect. Babe, go over there. Versus... No, but the directions are telling me to go this way. Just ask somebody, right? I'm the curious guy that I just want to ask somebody, ask somebody, ask, ask. And so if you have a high level of curiosity, you can pretty much get anything figured out uh, in life. It doesn't matter what it is. You can literally have anything figured out in life today if you have a high level of curiosity. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, you, you were saying how you're very curious and, and you, you like to go ask people um, to figure things out. Um, well, who, who would you say has been uh, the, the, the person or group of people who has been most influential to you in your, in your journey so far? In other words, who would you point to as, as a mentor to you? I would tell you that for me, dead, if I were to say a dead person, uh, it would be Milton Friedman. So I have a painting over here. You cannot see it. Let me go like this. You see that painting right there? I don't know uh -huh. if you see the painting or not. It ain't that big. Uh, is it big on your screen or no? Like, can you see characters or no? Not uh, really. Huh? Yeah, I can see uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, a couple others. Yeah, so if I go over here, you got Lincoln in the black. To his left is Kennedy and Einstein. Mm -hmm. Then you got a few other characters. But the one on the right, right next to uh, Martin Luther King. The guy with the glasses, he looks like Buffett, but that guy's Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman's probably had the biggest impact um, on my life philosophically, economically. A lot of dead people impacted my life because when I say dead people, you know, he, everybody on that painting is dead except the only person that's not dead, it's me. I'm the only one that's alive. Everybody else on that painting is dead and they have all impacted me. And so what I like, um, Ben, it's, I like opposing, uh, views. I like opposing, I study opposing views. I don't study a lopsided. Like some people say, I only listen to CNN and I love Barack Obama and I think he's the greatest in sliced bread. And then, you know, I, and listen, there's never been a better president with a better resume than Donald Trump and Fox news. And, you know, he has the best resume. You know what? I'm more of a libertarian independent. I kind of like Ron Paul. You know what I like? I want to hear all their arguments. That's kind of what I like. Uh, I want to read Communist Manifesto and I want to read Atlas Shrugged. You know, I want to look at a debate of Chris Hitchens, who's an atheist, and I want to see the argument of a Billy Graham. Uh, I want to see the argument of somebody who believes in real estate on why real estate is the way to go. I want to hear somebody say why investment in Silicon Valley is the way to go. I want to hear both. I think it's naive to just hear one side. A lot of times when we have parents, parents typically teach us one sided and you grow up. Oh, you just everything, everything, parents, everything, parents, everything, parents. My dad was a doctor, so I'm going to be a doctor. My dad was a teacher, so I'm going to be a teacher. My mother was a nurse, so I'm going to be a nurse. I, I'm not wired that way. So my biggest um, uh, influencers are sometimes people who I have the biggest opposing view with. Like, I don't agree with them, but they influence me tremendously. It's not just people that I agree with. Who are my influencers some of the people that are on there i don't agree with but they're on that painting because i learned from people i don't agree with uh you don't learn a lot from people that you agree with sometimes the best thing to do is say politically you're on one side economically you're on one side religious you're on one side okay so let's just say you're catholic christian scientology atheist seven day you know you're, you're scientology you're, you're jehovah's witness mormon lds baha'i whatever it is Whatever one that disagrees with you most, go sit with that person, not the people that all already agree with you. So I'll give you a story. There's a guy on MSNBC. His name is Morning Joe. OK, I don't know if you know Morning Joe. So Morning Joe, he's a good guy. He's funny and he's got big uh, uh, opinions about things. You're going to agree with half. You're not going to agree with half. He said one of the biggest advantages I had is I went to a school that was a liberal school. So he went to a school, look at the argument this guy makes, brilliant. He says, I went to a school that was a liberal school and I was a conservative, okay? He said, every class I took on political science or anything that was poli-sci, whatever, related to politics, 
He said every professor protected the students who were also liberal, but the professor didn't protect me. So he says, the reason why I have an edge is because I went to a school for four years where everybody was a Democrat and I wasn't. So the Democrats in my school didn't have to make their arguments stronger. I had to go home and do research. So every time they would say something, I'm like, shit, I lost this one. He would go home and like, no, they're wrong. Let me go back tomorrow. And he would come back with seven different arguments to make, right? Where the other guys are like, well, I won the argument because the teacher said I'm right. So they didn't have to have that resistance, right? I think sometimes that's the best way to make your argument stronger. I had a lot of resistance and that resistance helped me get to where I'm at right now uh, with the belief system that's helping out with the business and just philosophies, period, in life. So when you're asking about learning, students always wanting, I like to study people who disagree with me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, we, we talked uh, a lot about your past um, and, and I want to thank you for, for being so open with it. Um, I really do appreciate that. Uh, but, but I want to talk a little bit about right now. What is your biggest focus as of today um, in, 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 your, in your life? Uh, I am driven by history today. Uh, I'm driven by things that are probably weird to most people that if I talked about it, it, it probably, I mean, it's stuff I don't even talk about my own family with because it's a little too weird. Uh, history drives me. Certain countries drive me. Um, a world unemployment of zero drives me, uh, being able to spread this message of capitalism to people around the world and the countries that do not have access to internet and YouTube because YouTube is shut down in their countries and et cetera, et cetera. Those sorts of things drive me today. The guy that's being bullied or the girl that's being bullied because she or he is not getting access to the information to liberate them. I want to help that guy out. I want to help that girl out. And uh, money, I've already made very good money. I'm going to make a lot of money the next two, three, four, five years because money is very easy to make. It's math. Money is a formula. Once you learn how to make it, it's so easy to make money. It's almost it's funny to make money. Uh, it's a joke to make money once you learn it. Once you learn it. It's any video game you play. If I were to go play right now, you play Clash of, it's a Clash of Titans, let's just say. I don't know that game, but my friends play that game. Or if I were to go play any other game, I'm going to get my ass handed to me because the last time I played video games, was when it was a FIFA World Cup 1997 is when I played it. So that's what, that's 20 years ago, right? So I suck at video games. So if I were to play video games against anybody else, they're probably going to kill me. Uh, you know, if a person gets into the business world and you learn how to make money, you're always going to make it. But history to me, um, I feel there's a certain level of responsibility. And unfortunately, we're living in a time where it's all about who gets the most attention uh, for me, I'm, 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 I'm more fired up about what we're going to do with our vision long term. So uh, business wise, we have every metrics, you know, what we need to hit, what we're going to do 2018. We just did 11 quarters in a row of our top line revenue beat the prior quarter. I just bought a hotel down the street, uh, 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 the Addison Crown Plaza. We bought this uh, property here. Uh, uh, I, I just got Oscar De La Hoya, Gabriel Brenner and Adelaide Group, a $5 billion fund that invested $10 million into our company. Uh, you know, we got stuff that's going on with value some new partnerships, sponsorships, business wise with metrics. That's easy. History. That's that's a lot of work. So that's what drives me. So um, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, and, and I want to come back to the history thing, because I, I think that's very interesting. and I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, but you talked about how making money is easy. Um, and, you know, I feel like for a, an entrepreneur who's just getting started to them, that's just not the case, right? And you said you have to learn how to do it. What steps do, do entrepreneurs need to take when they're getting started to learn that? What steps do they need to take to learn how to make money? Figure out the formula in your business, you know? Like, you gotta answer the questions like, okay, number one, who is my ideal customer? A lot of times people come in, it's like being a boy who has never had sex before. Who's the first girl you wanna have sex with? You know, it's like, Dude, I don't care who I lose my virginity to right now. I just kind of want to lose it. You know, it's <laughs> embarrassing. I'm a 22-year-old virgin, let's just say. I, I don't want to be the freaking ideal movie. What's the one movie, you know, the 40-year-old virgin? I, I, a virgin. I don't want to be that. So at this point, dude, she's a four, no problem. Give me three beers, I'm good, right? Or even a girl in high school, maybe she's not the prettiest girl in high school. She gains her looks 
Later on, when she's 25, there was a lot of girls in high school that were ugly. I met them at 25. They're dropped at gorgeous. And there were a lot of girls in high school that were dropped at gorgeous at 16. They are ugly at 25. It's a very weird thing that happens, right? Uh, and same with men. This happens with men. But a 16-year-old girl, no one's asked her, to ask her to homecoming. Who does she want her to ask her for homecoming? She just wants to have a date. Can somebody just take me out to homecoming, right? Okay, cool. Awesome. Mom, I had a date. I went homecoming. Oh, me and Joe are going to homecoming. Well, he comes and picks. It's an experience. It's an emotional. You know, it's it, 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 for girls, it's more sensitive. I have two boys and have a daughter, so it's going to be a different experience for each when they go through it. And at that time, you're so worried about, well, uh, people are going to look at my ears or my eyes or my skin or my hair or I'm not tall enough. I'm short. I'm this. My arms are short. My feet are small. My feet are big. All these things that makes people insecure at that time, it's so gentle. It's like holding a crystal glass because it can crack, right? You know, especially today with social media, the endorphins, I only got 28 likes. Why didn't this person like me? Do they not like me anymore? Why isn't my best friend? It's a very different sensitive uh, uh, time today, right? So you go into the business side. When you first start selling, you just want somebody to buy from you. You don't care who it is that buys from you, right? And then you sell 20, 30, 40, 50 people. Now you got like, let's just say 100 customers. Then you say, you know what? These seven customers, man, they're amazing customers. Where are these guys? Where did I find them? Where do they hang out? Where can I get them? Oh, got it. I met him at this gathering that was in this city. Out of the seven, I met five of them in the same exact city. And it was three of them met him at the same exact restaurant or country club or gathering or gym. I need to be there more often. Perfect. Now you have some kind of a formula, right? Or you'll say, out of my last hundred sales online, 22 of them all purchased over $100. Where were they from? Mm, the four metropolitan cities, eight out of LA, six out of Chicago, four out of New York, whatever the math is, right? Like you come up with. Interesting. My top four buyers were from LA, Chicago, New York, and Miami. What do I need to do to get in there more? And where do they hang out? What is their interest? What do they like? What do they want to do? How can I get into that market? How can I get into that community? How can I get into that uh, uh, side of things, right? To be able to do that. That's what you're thinking about next, right? And so, you know, first thing is identifying who your customers, where are they, and then go there and close them and do business with them. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, um, you know, you talked a little bit about history and how you were very driven by history. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what exactly do you mean by that? What, what history are you driven by and how does that impact what you're focusing on today? Yeah, so what you're doing today is, is very uh, unlikely that it's going to outlive you. Very few things outlive you. What it inspires me is what outlives me. Everything today, uh, you know, it's going to have a lifespan, six months, three months, 12 months, 18 months, 22 months, six years. The victory is going to have a certain amount of time. So I want a long lasting high and something that I can do that makes the place a better place that lasts a lifetime and then outlives me. Uh, that's what drives me. And especially if you do that, it has to be something that is a positively influencing the world rather than just, hey, I want to be in a history book at all costs. You can go kill somebody famous and be in a history books for the rest of your life. But uh, it's positively. It's positively to make an impact. That's incredible. So, you know, we talked a little bit about your past. Um, we talked about kind of what you're focusing on right now. But what does the future hold for, for you? You know, what, what, where do you want to be 5, 10, 20 years down the road from now? And how are you going to get there? Yeah, I mean, listen, that's the whole part of the history, right? So, I mean, I got um, some things that uh, I'll be doing in my life. Um, uh, some of it will have to do with capitalism. Some of it will have to do with media. Some of it will have to do with uh, entertainment media. Uh, I'm always going to be touching business, always, for the rest of my life because it's so easy. Um, that part is not hard. You know, like I said, once you learn the game of business, it's so easy to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, it's just so you know, it's mapped out. I've written it out on what I'm going to be doing. Uh, and, and, and when a book comes out one of these days, I wrote a fiction book that's 96,000 words. It's fiction based on true events that took place. Okay. 
When this comes out, I think people are going to see a complete different side of me where they're going to be a little bit weirded out. They're going to be freaked out a little bit when this book comes out. And the book is probably not going to come out for two to three years. But when it does, people are going to sit there and they're going to say, who the hell is this guy? What is he thinking? It's going to be different. So that, that'll, that'll give a lot of people a few of the next two, three, four, five steps on what I may be doing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, you, you were talking about how, you know, you, when you put out that book, people are going to have a little bit different uh, perspective on you as an individual. Um, well, I'm kind of curious as to who do you see yourself as? Because we talked a lot about how other people perceive you and, and yeah. um, their perspectives. But who do you see yourself as and how important is that um, in, in your life? Yeah, I think the man upstairs, every generation, he's got a few flag carriers that he counts on. I just see myself as one of them. And, and you know, as like, how, how did you develop that, that sense of self? How did you really dig in and, and figure out that, that whole self-awareness thing? Very difficult life. Very difficult life. Um, um, and some stretches of, um, like for instance, I have a questionnaire, right? The ultimate self-discovery question. It's 83 questions that I have on my website. You go on patrickbaydavid.com. Uh, I got a hold of these questions back in 19, it was a 2003 is when I got a hold of these questions. And I went and sat down and I went through them. It was a afternoon. Um, when I went to, uh, 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 it was right by Zuma beach. I went to this place private by myself, went through all the questions. It's a very emotional moment when I went through this, but what happened that day is I figured out who Pat really is, who I really am. And, uh, that kind of inspired me to know that this life of what's been happening with a mother who believed in communism and a father that believed in imperialism. Uh, who ended up getting a divorce and living in Iran and escaping Iran and living in a refugee camp. The family was Christian. I was an atheist for 25 years of my life. And, you know, going through all these different events, there's some to it. And everybody at some point, you know, you know, the saying that says there's a saying that says some people are born to be happy. Uh, some people are born to make history. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, like Lincoln said, being a president was the greatest burden I ever had in my life. Yeah. But it's a burden and it's not something everybody wants. I was talking to a guy today about starting a company. I said, listen, you got to realize there's a lot of people that are smart for not starting a company. Smart for not starting a company. Um, because when you do, it is a massive uh, burden. So the reason for doing it has to be so big that you're willing to go through with it. It has to be that big. It cannot be a small reason. If it's a small reason, uh, you know, it's a waste of time. It's a, it's a small reason. You got to know your reasoning for what you're doing. So, you know, that's, that's what you, know, you asked the question, how I got to this point. I ask myself a lot of difficult questions, a lot of difficult questions. I can't even describe to you how many difficult questions I ask and I'm not uncomfortable with it. Wow. That's but I incredible. gave birth to a lot of these thoughts that I kept solving for X and deeper and deeper and deeper until I found the deepest Y. And then I said, listen, sounds like this matters to you. Why don't you take action on it? And I did. Some of them worked. Some of them failed miserably. But um, yeah, that's how I got to where I'm at right now. That's incredible. So, you know, Pat, I do want to thank you so much for, for jumping on the interview today. Uh, I can only imagine how, how um, you know, short on time you are. Um, but but I do have one more question for you. Um, what question did I not ask you that nobody has asked you before that is something that you think is really important that you need to say? What question did you not ask me? Um, interesting. It's a good question. Uh, ben, let me ask you this. Tell me about yourself in high school. Who were you in high school? 20 seconds. Who were you in high school? Uh, I was a leader, um, captain, and uh, I was somebody who tried to make peace amongst everybody else. When? What month's your birthday? What October. month are you? October. October what? 22nd. So you're on a cusp. You're on a cusp. Are, are you oldest brother? Are you the youngest sibling? Are you in the middle? Youngest. You're the, is it a big family or no? 
Um, not in my immediate family, but I have a big, uh, a lot of cousins. Got it. I, I, I really like you. Let me tell you, I, I really, really, you seem very sincere. So I'm October 18th. We're four days apart. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so you, what question would you ask me? You know, I would probably, and it's not like somebody hasn't asked me this, but I would spend a lot of, like, especially with your audience is, uh, would you say most of your audience is young and single? Uh, yes, sir. Probably. I would say marriage. I would say marriage. Uh, I would probably say marriage on, um, don't hurry it up. Okay. Take your time. Uh, nowadays, the later you get married, the better it is. And I'm not saying late as in 45, I'm saying late as in 30, 31, 32, 35. I think sweet spot is probably going to be 20, 30 to 35 years old today. It's very much different today than before. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities today. Get clear on who you marry. Uh, read the book 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged by Norman Wright. Uh, I read that book and I got clear on what I wanted. A lot of times men have no clue what they want for a wife. They're winging it. And a lot of times we're thinking that good sex and a beautiful girl is what makes a good wife. And that doesn't. Um, God knows how many hot girls that I was with that I wanted to be my wife. And they were just, you know, good for a month or a week or a day or a night or six months. But we just weren't made to, you know, take that route. So get clear, spend a lot of time. And the reason why I'm asking this, uh, saying this to you is because uh, who you end up with, even when you're in your 20s, man, it, just, it can really screw up your life. It can really mess with your life. You know, the better the positioning you put yourself where that influence of that girl uh, or that boyfriend to you for the girls that are listening um, be very clear on that side before you wing it. Be very, very clear on that side before you wing it. Relationships. I'd ask a lot more questions about that to see what people are telling you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Pat, I do want to thank you so much for jumping on the interview today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and, and, you know, it really does mean a lot that you would come on and, and share some of your knowledge today. So thank you. Let me tell you, great questions. Um, I like you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. You seem very real. If I was a young guy and I was following an audience, I would believe you. You don't seem like a bullshitter. You seem like you're very real and genuine. Uh, keep at it. And all the audience out there, best of luck to everybody. Thank you, sir. Well, everybody. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yep.